Hi, this is Pam Gildersleeve Hernandez, Executive Director at Q. On behalf of Microsoft and Q, welcome. Today we are connecting the community, a conversation on race and culture in education. Welcome to our moderator, Ken Shelton. All right, welcome everybody. Um, I, Pam wanted to uh, formally welcome you all as the executive director of Q, uh, as well as um, a shout out to our friends and partners with Microsoft. Um, we have uh, an amazing panel. Uh, I'm hoping that all of you or many of you were able to join us on Monday for uh, the panel that I had, which was a, a group of very uh, wonderful friends and educators, and uh, I'm beyond thrilled to uh, share the um, the opportunity to have this conversation with the current panel um, that hopefully you all have seen uh, the marketing graphics and and uh, and the social media posts that we put out. Uh, I'm I'm just as excited to moderate this conversation as I am to be a listener and learner for this conversation. So, without further delay, what I want to do is. Um, hand the mic over starting off with uh, Dr. Anthony Newbold so that our panelists can share with you a little bit about their background, about their role, and about their, um, if they if they uh, would like, a little bit about their identity as it pertains to them as, um, as educators and as panelists. So Dr. Anthony Newbold, please, if you don't mind. All right, thank you, Ken. Um, I appreciate you setting up this forum for us to have this uh, this very rich conversation. Um, my name is Anthony Newbold, and I am a principal in Fulton County, Georgia. Um, I've been here since 2002, but started my teaching career in 1999. Um, I'm originally from South Florida, um, was born in South Florida and raised in Coral Springs, Florida. And if you've listened to the news over the last couple of years, um, you'll recognize this name. I attended Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, so I grew up in a very diverse uh, environment. Uh, but in high school, I was one of the only black students, not even black males, but black students in many of my classes. Um, after high school, went on to Morehouse College here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and there, I, during my sophomore year, I took place in the, uh, participated in the Morehouse mentoring program. I went to a local elementary school and a black male teacher uh, said to me when I was asking him about what are some ways that I can go about helping the, the mentee that I was assigned. And the black male teacher stood there and he looked at me and he said these nine words and these nine words, I'll never forget them. It changed the course of my life. He said, there's nothing I can do for that kid now. And I kind of stood there and thought, you know, as an educator, you should always be doing something. You should always be trying to help this student. This student was struggling. Um, and from that point on, the, again, the whole trajectory of my life changed. Um, I went into psychology and ended up going into the Teach for America program and have stayed in education since 1999. Um, and I guess, you know, to, to sum it all up, the reason I do this, the reason I lead buildings and mentor teachers is so that I can ensure that the teachers have the resources and the support that they need so that they never can say and a student never will hear that there's nothing I can do for that kid now. Thank you very much for sharing that <clears throat> and you actually touched on something that um, we'll hopefully be able to unpack a little bit and further in our discussion is uh, the woefully inadequate diversity amongst our, our educational community in general, um, which is all the more reason why I'm so thrilled that we're together to have this conversation. Uh, and I'd like to shift it over to um, Sandra Galvan for her to share a little bit about her background as a role of being a superintendent here in California, yay. Uh, and, um, and, and, you know, again, some of your experiences that will help drive the conversation we're gonna have, please. Sure. So um, thank you, Ken. And I'm just so honored to be here and part of this conversation today. Um, I am a superintendent of the Greenfield Union School District, a super proud superintendent of that district. Um, and it is because I grew up in this district. Uh, we are in Monterey County in California. And so I'm super proud to, um, to be a product of my schools. Um, I'm in my fourth year as the superintendent and started education in 1993 as a classroom teacher. And my first assignment was here in Greenfield Schools. 
So I was a teacher at the exact same school that I that I went to. And so it's such a powerful message to tell our kids uh, that I was you. I, I see myself in your eyes when I go into classrooms and get to talk to them. I'm also super proud uh, to have to be on the CALSA, La Calza Latina uh, School Board. Um, I'm a proud Latinx student, a uh, product, a colleague, and also on the AXA, the uh, California board here in, in California. And so I tell you all of this just because I'm a third generation uh, Latina here in, um, in, in my, um, in where I've grown up. And I do that and I don't take that lightly because of my parents. And so just to share a little bit about my background, my parents were born and raised in West Texas, but my grandparents were immigrants from Mexico. And so I can never forget the struggles of those before us that have played, uh, that just played a critical part in giving us these opportunities to thrive and to, to live here. Um, in my town, uh, we definitely have a predominantly a Latino population. We have a few other uh, um, ethnicities here, but the primary is um, is Latino, and so when I when I uh, see kind of the the struggles that our our immigrants come from in Mexico to come here as a teacher, as a as a superintendent, I never take that for granted. As far as my family goes, I'm the youngest of six uh, six family members, and they all kind of uh, supported me growing up. And and one thing that um, I think our friend Dr. Anthony touched on is just our struggles in school. So I did see. Uh, I did see uh, the adversity as we kind of had to deal with that as young children and me being a little bit of a lighter Latina had different opportunities than my counterparts. And so I struggled with that and I struggled with advocacy and making sure that my peers had their voice heard in classroom and representation uh, in all of the things that we did. So in that, um, I'm really proud to be part of this conversation to be able to share our stories. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. So we started on the East Coast, then we went to the West Coast. Now we're going to go back to the East Coast. See what I did there? Um, and so our our uh, other our final panelist who is joining us um, comes from Virginia, Prince William County Schools. Uh, and so I'd like to welcome and please share with everyone uh, Lynn Colon, please. Thank you, Ken. And I am already inspired by uh, listening to my colleagues' mm -hmm. background. So uh, my name is Limara Colon, and I have the honor of serving as the Director of English Learner Programs and Services for Prince William County. We have 90,000 students and 29,000 uh, are English learners. We have 140 languages represented, and I have the, the privilege of uh, leading the translations department, the K-12 instruction, central registration, and the professional learning for all things L. Uh, but I am not from here. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, came here when I was 19 with very limited uh, English. And I will tell you, um, every day I, I wake up and I feel blessed to be able to live the American dream. I, I tried coming here when I was 10. We had a hurricane in Puerto Rico, Hugo, most of you probably remember, and we didn't have school for seven months. So my my mom was trying to figure out what she was gonna do because the, the country was trying to decide whether or not we were gonna lose the year. And I remember coming and being assessed and they said, she doesn't speak any English. Uh, we're gonna have to retain her. And then my mom saying, no, you're going to have to go back. So years later, uh, I came as a senior, stood in front of the Capitol steps and told the girl next to me, I'm going to live here one day. And she told me, well, you do know that you need to learn English first. And uh, I haven't found her on Facebook or on Instagram, but uh, one day <laughs> we will we will meet each other again. And hopefully I can share all the great things that um, you know, I have accomplished on the opportunities that I've experienced here, but I will say um, I'm in this role out of purpose. I uh, feel so responsible for sharing my story and and just encouraging kids like me to live what I call my my little Disney dream. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, you know, I think it's uh, before we as we shift over into the first question, um, that I actually will shift back to um, to Anthony for. Um, for those of you that are tuning in, if you tuned in to the previous conversation, I, I hope you're starting to see the complexity of, of all of our identities, of our backgrounds, of what 
everyone is contributing to as far as the educational community goes uh, and how unique um, everything is from who are the first immigrants in the family here to our upbringing to the experiences and how that shaped us. And Lynn actually brought up something that I think it's important for us to maintain in regards to perspective on our roles in education. At some point, every single student is an English language learner. So it's important to keep that in mind that the development of language, in this case specifically English, might occur later um, in, the, in the educational experience of a student, but at some point, every single student is an English language learner. Now, with that being said, I want to shift this first question over uh, to Anthony because you touched on it a little bit. Um, and obviously, I, I do know exactly where you went to school. Um, and, uh, and, and it's been in the news for um, things that we hope will not occur any further in education, especially, but really in society. But what I really want to ask you is, um, can you share a little bit about how your cultural identity uh, shaped your educational experiences? And you touched on it a little bit. How did it shape your ed educational experiences? And more specifically, did it create any barriers or obstacles towards you becoming where you are now? OK, uh, absolutely. I would love to, to talk on this. So uh, has has my race been a factor? Absolutely. I think I mentioned early on that, um, you know, in many of my classes as, as as a high school student, I was one of the only black students in my class. So, you know, if, if you've ever been in that situation before, you know that when issues of, of race come up or racism, if you are one of the only people in that class represented, um, that you know, people, all eyes kind of look toward you for all of the answers. And so it it puts kind of a, an extra weight on your shoulders where you feel as if you have to be the voice for that group. Um, but as I've kind of transitioned into a professional and more specifically as an administrator, uh, yes, being a black male, there are lots of factors that go into, you know, my, my everyday thought. So I always have to remain cognizant of my voice level, um, of my, my tone. Um, you can't see because I'm sitting here, but I am, I stand six foot five inches tall. You know, I'm not a big, big guy, but I am a very tall guy. And so, you know, am I, am I being too, uh, am, am I overexerting myself or am I unintentionally intimidating someone? And so, you know, being a black male, those things are always on my mind. So to give you an, a further example, I have to ask myself if I need to meet with a teacher, do I meet with this teacher alone? Do I meet with this teacher in my office? Um, so I can't have some of the critical conversations that some of my colleagues are able to have because I'm always aware of who I am and how that may that may come off. And so, yes, that does create barriers, that does create obstacles, but, you know, I, I, I keep pushing, I, I persevere, and I put measures in place so that I don't have to think about that. So I may have to call someone else into the meeting um, in order to facilitate a meeting with one of my teachers. Um, you know, I was a principal at a more diverse school. I also had to be aware of my, my Blackness when dealing with the student body. So am I showing too much interest in one area or another? Or am I, be, am I being an equal advocate for all of my students? And so all of those things are constantly at play. Um, and it, it, does, it does affect your decision making. Um, it, it affects the way that you, you carry yourself. So absolutely, uh, my, my race has for sure been a factor. It has definitely created barriers but you know, you you continue to 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 try to find ways to jump those hurdles and uh, and continue on with the the good work of educating students. You know, and I I I was originally going to pose this question only two of the three of you, but I think it's critical that all of you that your voice is heard in regards to this. And um, what I do want to share with the audience is uh, one of the things that Anthony just mentioned. You know, it's um. It's the many masks that we have to wear. It's the self-imposed or self-induced trauma that is a byproduct of the cultural environments that we have to navigate through. 
And so for the audience here, what I what I want you all to be mindful of, and then I'm going to shift over to uh, Zandra for the to answer the question and share her story around this as well, um, is that it's hard enough for us to do this as adults. So you can imagine what it's like for a 13 year old, a 10 year old, a 17 year old, where they don't have uh, the life of work, life experience, if you will, to be able to formulate their actions, be more cognizant of their actions, and then the terminology that allows them to fully express how they're feeling or what they're thinking. And so I, I just share that brief comment because ultimately it ties in with my stance on any social and emotional learning program. And that is if that program doesn't provide student agency and as well as student confidentiality and safety, then that program needs to be dumped. Now, with that being said, um, Sandra, will you please share, you know, some of your thoughts around that same question? How has your, and you shared a little bit in your intro, how has your cultural identity and your upbringing, if you will, uh, not only shaped who you are, but did it create any obstacles or barriers in your overall educational experience as well? Please. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I, my, my mind's all over the place because there's so much I want to say on this topic. It's like, um, yes, absolutely. So my upbringing in terms of the opportunities that were provided um, to me as a young a, a young girl here in Greenfield, and then also the transformation of me coming back as the, the leader of the whole organization and really thinking through of like, if I don't do it, no one will. If I don't uh, stand up against anything, no one will. And if I allow it, then it's going to allow to perpetuate. And so First thing on is uh, I think of the experiences and I engage our wonderful staff. I, I have to tell you that I'm so proud of the Greenfield Union School District staff. Every single person from um, all of our classified to our teachers to our administrators because they care so deeply about every single one of our students. We have so many of our children um, that go off and become educators and come back to Greenfield because they love our, our community and they know how important it is to give back and to raise our own. So I can't even tell you, uh, you know, that's a whole nother topic about giving back to your, your, your community. But I, I must say, um, going back to what um, we had mentioned a little bit in our in our introduction is we have 70% uh, of our students are English learners. I have 95% of our students that are free and reduced lunch. I have 100% of my students that are highly capable. Our mission in Greenfield is all means all. Your zip code is never going to predetermine what you can do in life. And so with that being said, we, I, when I first got here and I, I'm going into my fourth year, and so my very first year, I had to analyze everything in the systems and the institutional barriers that existed in Greenfield. And we had to really take a hard look and I had to engage people who were used to certain things always because that's the way it was done here. And with all means all, like that is something that we breathe, we, we like, live that dream and so i had to have some courageous conversations with people and i'll tell you racism and and, and all with against other races but also within a culture is also very prevalent and so we have first generations we have second generations we have third generations and so i had to have conversations with some of our our community members in terms of the brown kids the darker the the poor kids the misbehavior kids the misfits that you are seen as labeled don't have to lose for your kid to win. Like they don't have to lose for another person. We all can win. And so we engaged in conversations and I talked to so many staff members that, that knew it was the right thing to do because here's what I told them. I said, listen, if we are gonna predetermine the post-secondary success of our students, and I'm an elementary district, but we look pie in the sky, we look through A through G, we talk about all the things that are gonna be those post-secondary um, opportunities for our kiddos. And I said, which one of you would like to get on the phone and call the parents of that child as a sixth grader, as an eighth grader and say, I have predetermined for your child that they will not be on that college or career pathway. Who's ready to say that? No one was ready to say that. No one was, but they were ready to perpetuate and continue with these bad institutional barriers that were going to be there. But until it got real and we saw the faces of our kids, no one would argue. And I got to tell you that we've come a long way in the last three years and some staff members have left because it wasn't in their mission and their vision on what, what they wanted to do here. And I'm okay with that because the people who are in this uh, organization today, I am so proud of because they will do whatever it takes to meet the needs of our students. And I'll tell you, with COVID, it was a challenge, but everyone sprung into action to make sure that distance learning happened. I leaned on Q, we leaned on Microsoft, we leaned on so many organizations to help us because one of the critical pieces that exposed equity 
was Wi-Fi and technology. It was a bold, poke your eye out exposure of what was truly um, in the homes of our students and the opportunities for them. We had devices, but without Wi-Fi, we couldn't continue distance learning. And our teachers were crushed. They wanted to see their children. They wanted to teach them, but they couldn't access. And so equity was exposed when it came to that. And we had to hustle quickly to get the Wi-Fi towers in place to make sure that our kids were, their needs were being met. But with all of this, I'm so passionate about this because Finally, when you've arrived, and, and I think um, we've talked about this a little bit of the leader, and, and never take your leadership role lightly. Hold it close to your heart, because every decision that I make as a superintendent impacts a face. It impacts a family. It impacts the trajectory of every student, every, every particular student that we serve, and we are committed to making sure that their hopes and dreams are met. But I never, never make a decision without really talking to others and really um, looking at the aftermath, but it's got to go back to saying 70% English learners, 95% socially economic disadvantage, but 100% capable, 100% capable. Thank you for that question. <laughs> okay, so I want to run up to Monterey County right now and be right there <laughs> next to you <laughs> for these whole thing. Uh, uh, for the audience, if you're not fired up already, then well, we have another panelist that you will be fired up even further. This is why these conversations are critical for us to have and for it to be accessible to the audience, because these are the stories that people need to hear of, you know, to the point you just made, you know, around courageous leadership. You know, I, I, I equate leadership to being only one or the other. It's either cowardice or it's courageous because cowardice mm -hmm. is either maintenance of the status quo or not making the right decision for the right reasons for the interests of the children. Or to your point, which you are a courageous leader, which is one of the reasons why I was so thrilled you agreed to be on this panel, is really looking at, you know, what are the decisions that I'm making that that affect the children? Because ultimately, that's why we do what we do. So I thank you so much. And so, Lynn, I'd love for you to bring it all together. Share, give us some, some of your rather share with us some of your story on some of your upbringing, how it, how, and you did share a little bit, especially um, the, as a result of Hurricane Hugo uh, in Puerto Rico and coming over to the States. And, uh, but I'd love for you to share a little bit more around just how did your culture, how did your identity play a factor in your educational experience? Again, what obstacles and barriers may have been put in place and how does that shape where you are now, please? So I, I'm going to be very vulnerable right now because my, my story is a little bit different. Um, I was a really good student back home, uh, at, you know, straight A's. The message was that you have a lot of potential. And um, I actually went to college when I was 15 after the whole thing with trying to come here to the United States. So then at 19, I come to the United States with very limited English. And keep in mind, I had gone to college in Puerto Rico, very successful. And I'll be very vulnerable with you all. Uh, I heard the narrative about the lack of language so many times that it created a movie in my head that I was not meant to be successful in this country. And uh, I started as a social worker and then moved into teaching and saw what was going on. And I had that fire in me of, Lynn, you, you have to do something. And, and part of the story also is, um, uh, in, yeah, Sonia probably knows this, um, we carry our father's last name. So I come here and I have to give up my last name because I was told that's what we do here. Then I go from <laughs> Lynn Mara to Lynn. So I, you know, kind of lost my first name too. And then this identity, I, I kept losing and losing and losing, but then seeing how it was affecting the, the students that I was teaching, a fire within me that said, you have to do something, but then not feeling very confident that I could be the one to, to make an impact and a change. So then I moved to uh, be an assistant principal and, and a principal a role that I love. And when this role came, and I am the first uh, Hispanic female to have this role, I doubted myself. Again, that voice 
came back, are you polished enough to create policy? Are you polished enough to represent this huge and amazing school division? Uh, and I wrestle with it. And I'm telling you now, every day I wake up so responsible and, and so inspired just to share the story and not allow kids to feel the same thing I felt uh, as I was you know, just getting adjusted uh, to the change and letting them know you too can be successful. If you spend a couple of minutes with a couple of minutes with me, you'll hear me talk a lot about Disney and, and it's the analogy I use to the experience that every student, regardless of what language they speak, color, where they come from, should experience when they come to our schools. Uh, we should not be checking those boxes. They should have access to a magical experience and um, I hope that as a result of my leadership, that's what every student in Prince William County uh, gets to experience on a daily basis. Thank you all very much. I, I really, I, I wanna stress to the audience how important it is that part of our contributions to the learning environments that we work in, whether it's as an aide, a classroom teacher, a site level administrator, or a di district level administrator, um, is really ensuring that our students can see themselves reflected in the curriculum, and even more impactful if they see themselves look at this panel. So uh, that leads me to, um, and Sandra, I'll go to you this time around to start off. It leads me to um, the next question that I have, um, and all of you have kind of touched on it, which I, I love it because I have questions I want to ask, and and you all are helping me actually frame a little bit more depth to them because all all three of you have shared instances where you um, you know it's something that a lot of us unfortunately have to navigate, and uh, and you all have heard the term, so for the audience I'll repeat it is imposter syndrome, because if you don't if you don't see yourself as successful if the messaging that you're constantly getting is that you're less than or even worse what i see unfortunately too much in education is deficit-based language which is a a um a byproduct of dehumanization um you you then begin to doubt yourself and i know that anyone who's on this call and anyone who's viewing this if you've ever been in a situation where you've doubted yourself that is not necessarily a pathway towards success um, and so what I want to ask um, Sandra to share is in your role, obviously, as the superintendent in Greenfield and even as a leader, uh, and I do want to I'm watching the clock and we have enough time. I really want all three of you. I originally was only going to be two of you, but this is too important and rich of a discussion for me to limit uh, your voices. Can you share how? I guess the best way I can put it is leaders in many cases can drive the culture of the building or of the district. And can you share how you, in being mindful of that, have shaped the culture of your district that really looks at how you're beginning to dismantle the barriers or the pathways towards student success? I mean, you touched on the zip code thing, but I'm thinking more in terms of the culture and you and, and I'm going to let you share. But even in terms of the fact that, like you established a culture that sadly some teachers didn't see that as a part of their mission in education and that's why they left. So can you share just a little bit more about how how important you establishing that type of culture is in your district? Oh, thank you for that question. So um, I'll just start with walk the walk like don't just talk about it but you got to walk it and so one thing for me is um, i'm not going to tell someone to do something that i'm not willing to do myself and so when i uh, talk about uh, culture or treating people with human dignity and kindness and honoring their culture and engaging them in conversations because we need to know their story we cannot just assume that we know who makes up ken or who makes up me or who makes up Juanito, like we can't predetermine that for anyone. We have to sit down and engage them. And so the culture in Greenfield is really about honoring who you are and really leading our students through this trust. And I'll, and I'll have to tell you, um, we have some really great um, opportunities here in Greenfield to engage our students in those conversations. And, and you know, not a lot of great things came out of COVID, but one thing that it did, it, it really brought value to human connection and the relationships and our emotional intelligence. We're all smart people. You know, by virtue, we have our degrees, we have our, you know, the letters that are after our name, and that's great. That's the academic part of it. 
but the human connection is something we can never ever undervalue and underutilize with the emotional intelligence and so what uh, we're actually talking about right now when it comes to culture as we're i just got off a call this morning and we had some uh, 40 powerful cross-section of, of educators parents uh, community members that are on our reopening schools task force so what are we going to do? How are we going to honor our students? How are we going to talk about instruction? How are we going to talk about safety? How are we going to talk about wellness? How are we going to design our professional development to embrace our students who are coming back with so many different things going on in their head? They miss our schools like crazy and we miss them like crazy. And so how do we build that? It's by leading by example. And so one of the things that we've been talking a little bit about is how do we build some restorative justice circles? and honor who they are. How do you build trust? How do you talk about the experiences and not assume that we know their story? Many of my students struggle. Many of my students that are serving in Greenville are indigenous uh, cultures from Mexico. And as I touched on earlier, there are so many different uh, states in Mexico that most of our kids come from. And in, in the state of Mexico, we have a predominantly indigenous population that are right here in Greenfield. They chose Greenfield, their forefathers, the, you know, the folks that they sent before them chose Greenfield for a reason. And so in our valley here, lots of greenery, lots of lettuce, a lot of, you know, all the grapes, all the things that you know, feed the rest of the country, a lot of it comes right here from the Salinas Valley. And so with that being said, we have to learn their stories in order to honor them. And so I can't say it enough about in my role as the leader, I develop experiences. I am able to um, allow our folks to have the conversations with students because we build that into the schedule. How do we honor the counselors and, and, and allow our counselors to talk to us as educators and teach us how to engage our students in those very risky conversations because kids will not share with you things that they don't feel safe. If they don't like you and they don't trust you, they will never open up to you. So how do we allow our students to build that? And it, and it gets a lot, it's easier in pre-K, totally easier there. The little ones, the four-year-old will tell us everything about everything, right? But when you get up to eighth grade, they need to know that, that you love them in order to open up. And those stories are critical to building a positive culture as we move forward and to be able to, to dismantle, to provide those opportunities and to make sure that our kids are going to be um, confident confident that our educational systems and our organizations are going to meet their needs. Thank, thank you. So much. Yeah, thank, thank you for sharing that. And you, um, you all, you've touched on, and, and Lynn, I'd love to come to you next, and then we'll conclude this question with Anthony. You touched on something that uh, I love sharing the story of um, when I was in college at uh, UCLA, um, instead of studying Spanish, I, I chose to study Zulu. Uh, and so, yeah. <laughs> um, which, you know, uh, it's one of the beauties of studying languages. By me studying Zulu, I also learned even more about the history of South Africa through the lens of language, uh, which, you know, again, is his history, culture, and all those sorts of things. But the reason why I say that is I do include in one of my talks is a, the formalized greeting in Zulu is uh, to an individual is Sawubona, and to a group it's Sani Bonani. But, but loosely translated into English, it's not hello, it, it means it's I see you. And then the response is um, Gikona, which means essentially I am here because of you. So what you're touching on is the whole idea that I would love for everyone on this call who's a leader. And, and again, I'm going to shift over to Lynn in just a moment is the whole idea around what what are our most basic level needs? We want to be seen. We want to be heard. We want to be loved. And you're touching on that. And I was I would actually even argue that those should take a significant precedent over anything that is curriculum based, because if you're not, then you can't be your whole self. So I really appreciate you sharing that. And um, Lynn, I would I'd love to go over to you now just to kind of share again around as your role as a leader and even with what you've uh, been uh, vulnerable in sharing, which I, I will tell you that I, on a personal level, I, significant, I sincerely appreciate you sharing uh, you know more about your personal story here because it 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 helps us it fuels us it fuels me, uh, but I'd like to know from you as as a leader is how has how have you noticed or how have you has culture shaped uh, the opportunities that exist for the students that uh, are within your school uh, system your school district please. So you know one of the things that that we have done is embrace this hashtag and theme of all are welcome all are welcome and it goes back to what you were see, saying about being uh, seen and I'll give you an example uh, COVID did something amazing for us and it was just using a platform like this to meet with parents and just allowing them 
to to tell us how do they feel about the technology and these are you know immigrant parents that they don't speak the language we brought um, interpreters to the forum but just again not about the learning but how is it going for you uh, just having conversations and meeting people where they are because I know how I felt when I go into certain situations and people don't know the the degrees or the job and they just see uh, someone who is from another country that might uh, have a strong accent and mess up some verbs at times. Uh, I wanted the parents to know, hey, I I can sit at the same table with you. Let's have dinner. I call it the dinner table. Let's do life together. That to me is so mm -hmm. important uh, because it, it that that's really the type of conversations we we need to have. And if anything, I'm I'm happy to be in this forum today. I'm happy that we're engaging with families. And yes, they bring their kids, but they do have a story that helps me understand their learners better. That helps me be intentional with the money, with the resources and the time. I don't want to be a leader that's in the office creating programs and policies uh, for people that I don't know. I want to make sure that they know I am listening and that I am being purposeful and, and intentional with, with my time and that whatever happens that I left a legacy where people feel value and and they felt okay I had a taste of that American dream. Thank you so much and you know I have to say you all are filling my bucket. I, I really do. I you 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 have um, and then we'll shift over to Anthony. You all have uh, have given me um, a degree of um, energy through this screen that I have such high hope and such I know that there's such promise because you all are just representational of many of the educators uh, really not just even in the United States but globally that that are really looking at the core root of why we do what we do um, and now we'll we'll touch a little bit more on that but I want to shift over to Anthony now so um, you know Anthony you, you again you did share a little bit earlier um, can you uh, expand upon you know how as a leader how how have you been the driver for the culture and more specifically the culture that um, can dismantle barriers uh, towards students uh, opportunities and access awesome thank you um there have been so many phrases and and things that have come up just in these in these short little conversations that we've had here um, that really kind of lead into this question and you're right ken as leaders in our buildings you know we do set that tone and i can remember my very first principalship you know i had teachers walking around blowing whistles at students and you know walking around with yardsticks and shooing them up the hallway and that's not how you treat anyone and I had to really set that tone. So I think you you start with those, you know, you have to set those expectations and what are your non-negotiables around how we're going to engage with our students. Um, and, and that that encompasses having conversation um, and, and really what it boils down to is that 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 point that you talked about, Ken, where you use that phrase, I see you. And to me that translates to gaining an understanding of who you are as a person and then that takes us into that educational term that is always thrown out there that that cultural responsiveness and so i'll, I'll give you two hard and fast examples um, my wife and i were shopping at walmart and we were walking around and it was a, a local walmart for the community that that my school served and there was a parent shopping and in the in her cart on in the buggy she had her phone and her phone was playing loud music out of it. And I thought for a moment, oh man, that's inappropriate for this particular setting. But then it, it, it made me take a step back because I see my students doing that all the time. And so now I'm understanding that my student's model is their parent. And so do I admonish this student? Do I discipline this student for something along those lines? Or do I use that as a teachable moment, understanding where they're coming from to teach them, hey, in this particular setting, let's not do that. But in other settings, you may be you know, at liberty to do that. Another one 
and, and, and those in other districts may, um, may, may understand this. One of the highest disciplinary infractions that, that I've seen is disrespect. And so it's it's just a, a blanket statement because it's up for a person's interpretation. I grew up in a, a Caribbean family. And in many Caribbean families, if your parent calls for you and you say what, that's disrespectful. You know, the, you you might you might get hurt a little bit for, for doing that. Um, but in some households, that is perfectly acceptable. And so if a student is in a classroom and they answer a teacher what, they're not trying to be disrespectful. And so when you talk about that cultural responsiveness, you know, you can use a lot of these opportunities to teach on both sides of that of that coin. Let's teach the students that when I'm when I'm at work and my boss calls me, I don't say what. If uh, but for for a teacher, the, the, the teaching on that side and the education on that side is in this student's home, that response is acceptable. And so how do we meet in the middle and, and make sure that we are passing down the skills that our students are going to need as they enter into college and the workforce? So how do we continue to pour into them so that they are prepared? And so I just kind of describe it as, as, as raising awareness um, on both sides. And I like someone said, you know, we're meeting students where they are. And I think that that is the key to kind of setting that tone meeting and teaching as we continue to prepare students in all aspects of education. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, you touched on another thing that I put a comment in the chat for the audience um, is, you know, we're talking about race and culture, and I, I do have another question uh, that I want to get to in just a moment for all three of you that I'm going to raise the um, I would say the intensity of the questions, um, but I, I do want to just emphasize to the audience here. You know, I talked about it in the, with the panel on Monday uh, that there there are three different layers of culture. So just to sum it up for the audience here, the top layer is what I identify as highly visible and low mental intensity. So it's the clothes that we wear, the music that we listen to, the way we dance, the food we eat, things that are again highly visible but low mental intensity. The next layer down that that Anthony even just touched on there are things that are still visible but require a slightly higher degree of mental intensity. So it's things like our speech patterns and the vernacular that we use. And one of the things that I have noticed both when I was in school, to Anthony's point, as well as even when I was a teacher, is this whole idea around tone policing. Because what you have to understand is that tone policing uh, essentially creates a cultural hierarchy in the way that we communicate. So for example, I don't speak here or in a professional setting in the same capacity or same vernacular that I do when I'm around my close friends. It's, it's called code switching, for those of you that don't know. Code switching is not a bad thing. To Anthony's point, which is something I used to always tell my students, is you want to understand what is the most effective way to communicate in the setting of which you are in. That way you don't place a hierarchy or a cultural hierarchy on how you communicate. It's having an awareness of what is the setting am I in and what is the most effective way to, to communicate. Uh, and so then with that being that with that being said, is we want to be mindful of using it as a teachable moment. I happen to have been in a classroom where it were, there were a lot of different cultural identities and cultural representation. And so for me as a teacher, I was like, tell me more, teach me more, you know, because ultimately it, it, to Anthony's point, you hear that, that phrase culturally responsive, you can be more responsive when you understand that something that might seem different uh, to you may be normalized for that student given their cultural identity. Uh, and the more that we validate that, the more responsive we are, the more that the child or the student, for that matter, feels welcomed in that space. Um, so the next question, I, I'm going to go ahead and shift back over to Lynn, if you don't mind, please, is, you know, all of you are leaders, all of you are sharing beautifully rich and depth story in detail stories about your backgrounds and about your roles. The question I want to ask all three of you just kind of, again, raising the bar with the questions is, how do you assess the impact of the decisions that you make on the students? And given what you all have shared with your backgrounds, all of you have identified barriers and obstacles that you had to overcome to be successful. In your role as a leader, how do you dismantle those so that none of your students have to go through those same barriers or obstacles? So, you know, I have to go back again to leading 
uh, from the field and being in the field. I am very, very passionate and I love being in schools. I love talking to the students. Uh, I think that data from surveys is great, but when you're having conversations with your students and, and those who you're leading, it becomes even more powerful. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you an example. One, one of the things we were trying to figure out was why older English learners were just uh, quitting on us. Uh, and and I, I started visiting the high schools and talking to some of our students. And, you know, I learned trying to get a job. I'm trying to support my family. Uh, really, I'm coming to school because I want to learn enough English to get me a driver's license so I can drive to a better job. Uh, and we were able to make changes that way. That is data that I can't get from giving kids a survey, but I can be more intentional now about how I'm spending uh, the funds at the division level to help these students. Um, and then also going back to my story, if I don't share my story with them, then I'm missing an opportunity to let them know, hey, there's great things waiting for you and you too can make what I call uh, magic happen. So um, people by day, paper by night, that's, that's really how um, I like to lead and also creating spaces for people to let me know what they're thinking and give me feedback. And that means students, uh, parents, and the staff. Uh, I, again, I mean, I, I like surveys, but I like to engage in the conversation and also let them know that this is a safe space where they can ask questions and we can engage in discourse so that we can be better together and that we can learn where each one is coming from. I know I've learned a lot uh, recently because I'm not from this country. So when you talk about history and the events that are happening, um, I too have a lot to learn because the history I learned was back in, in Puerto Rico. So I, I would hope that there's an exchange where people are asking thought provoking questions that we can challenge each other's thinking so that kids can win as a result of our collaboration. Thank you very much. And I had to capture that in the chat. I love it. People by day, paper by night. There's your, there, there's another, there's a tweetable quote for those of you that are tuned in. Thank you so much. Um, so let's shift over to, uh, to Sandra. Can you um, share again, share some of the thoughts around how do you assess the impact of the decisions you make uh, with the students? And you did share uh, personal stories around some of the obstacles you had to overcome. How, as a superintendent, have you been, uh, have you been mindful of, of removing some of those barriers for the students in, within your district? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> so thank you for that question. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, within that question is opportunities. And so the, the things that we've done in Greenfield over the last three years is increase opportunities and not only just the opportunity, but the access, the application, the completion of that. And so I'll give you a really simple example. Uh, my middle school, uh, we, I looked at the elective pathway and I looked at some of the offerings that we had that I inherited three years ago and they were, they were not robust. They would definitely not be A through G approved if you're looking at a high school uh, college board certification, right? So we engaged people and we started talking about what are our kids like? What do they want to do? What's in their hopes and dreams? And I'll tell you, we backwards mapped it and we studied the market trends. We looked at the job market trends within Monterey County. We looked at what are the predominant careers here in California that students can be um, having access to. And one of those things that we looked at, and again, I'm an elementary district. I don't have a high school yet, so I'm, but I'm still prepping for post-secondary success. And so we looked and we're right next to Silicon Valley, STEM careers. You know what we did our very first year is we invested our local count, uh, control accountability funds to create hands-on experiences for our students. And so what did we do? We partnered with Lego. We partnered with Apple. We partnered with First Robotics, and we started looking at STEM careers. If we want our kids to succeed in the post-secondary world, we have to give them rich experiences and assess those experiences and survey them and talk to them. What do you love? What do you do? I am so proud to say my middle school offerings of electives are digital animation, are robotics and conceptual design. We have green architecture. 
we have uh, um, girls in engineering. We have all of these careers, opportunities for them to start coding. And so I went over there, you know, before we, we had invited some people from Career Tech Education and Snap-on Tools, for an example, and then with Apple Education, and they're coming in and they're saying, okay, how can we help you uh, build your, your partnership? And what happens is this, you start telling your story and you show your kids in action and how smart and how capable they are. People take notice and they want to invest in kids who are so smart, but not, not otherwise would have been afforded that opportunity. And so the folks over at my middle school, the, we backwards mapped that down to kindergarten and we're starting to see coding in there and starting to build out those career pathways. But we don't, I mean, we talk with them about everything. We survey the kids, we have our electives wheel, we ask them, what do you want to do? And we honor those. We give them the experiences, but then we honor what they want to do when it comes to those extra uh, chosen um, careers. And so we have people come into Greenfield. We have people walking through classrooms and all those kinds of things because they see the passion in our kids. And all it takes is just that spark to be able to, to produce an opportunity. So how do we assess it? I assess it through um, looking at the outcomes for students, looking at what their interests, is, interests are and making sure that we're meeting those needs of our students. And I am not predetermining. I am not saying, I think, you know, this particular elective is the flavor of the month and I'm going to give that to you because I think that's what you want. No, we don't do that here. We make sure that we're meeting their needs and we're exposing them to more every day so that then they see, ah, I want more. So the skill set when they leave us, is robust, it's challenging, and we have to now respond and raise the bar because they know more. They're like, they're ripping apart cell phones and they're looking at the back end in, in sixth grade, in seventh grade. So can you imagine what they're gonna be in high school and what they're gonna be at their, at their university? And so that's how we really obsess it. But opening doors is the first step to making sure that we provide those opportunities in our assessments. Uh, if I may say, it sounds to me like you're knocking doors down, not even just opening them. <laughs> and um, and <laughs> yeah. we're going to shift over to Anthony, but I, I do I do want to share a quick thought because what you and Lynn mentioned are two things that that really I think is important for school leaders to again another thing to be mindful of is uh, borrowing from uh, what Lynn shared is the fact that you know. When students walk into your your buildings or in your district, you're not just welcoming the student, you're welcoming the family. And if you look at it from that perspective, mm -hmm. that that's the whole it takes a village. That's why even the, the title of this series is you know, building community because we all are a community. And then you brought up a, a, another thing as well, Xandra, that I think is important for us to really, you know, I, I really stress to educators the nuance of language and you the key word you just mentioned. Uh, as far as the access that you are ensuring your students are providing with the partnerships is investment. You're investing in the kids, you're investing in their education. It's not an expenditure, it's an investment. So mm -hmm. I think I, I just wanted to point Absolutely. those two things out for our audience here. And um, and then let's go, let's shift over to Anthony. And then we've got, um, I'm going to try to pull one question from the audience. Otherwise, we'll shift into just some final thoughts. And uh, let's go ahead and shift over to Anthony now, please. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll be I'll be pretty quick with mine because, you know, the ladies shared some very, very strong points. And one of the things that when you first posed the question that I, um, was was kind of harping on was that word access ensuring that our students have access so you know we have all of those quantitative measures we talk about graduation rate and decreasing dropout rate and attendance some of that qualitative data as far as like do students want to come to school but we i think we really need to just continue to try to even out that playing field for many of our students um, by by granting them that access access to information um, access to career choices. Um, I, I didn't share this at the very beginning, but I'm actually starting up a new STEM school. So I got excited to hearing you talking about your robotics and things along those lines. Um, but I'm starting up a new STEM school. And one of the things that we're really hanging our hats on is that mentorship piece and those partnerships to bring people who look like our students from industry into the schools to really show them the relevance of what they're learning and why they're learning it. So I, I really like that. Um, I came across a quote not too long ago and I think I tweeted it, you know, several, several years back maybe, but it talked about um, what if we stopped planning lessons 
and started creating learning experiences. And so that one really resonated with me. And so when, we, when we're bringing these people in, you know, let, let's get away from just that standard old, you know, seven point lesson plan and let's get into rich learning experiences for our students. That's going to require us to bring in technology. Um, I've, I've done a lot of work with Microsoft and I've led a Microsoft showcase school. I brought in innovative ideas to my school like Teach to One, which is a, a self paced uh, math program, um, you know, encouraging teachers to provide students with choice and voice. And so what that does is that creates this experience for our students that make them want to come to school, make them want to try new things and ultimately become more confident and more successful as students. So I think those are some of the things that that I would really like to uh, to continue to focus on. And I, ho I hope the audience has been able to connect the dots with what all three of you have shared around, you know, again, I'm going to use that word investment. And it's an investment. Our time is an investment. Our work is an investment. The investment is not limited to um, the, the, let's say, the, the geometrical boundaries of a fence around the school or a wall around the school. And I love the fact that, you know, you all have shared ways in which you are um, essentially examining the complexity of investing in the experiences that we want our students to have. And, you know, it's a, it's a Maya Angelou quote is, you know, the, you remember how people treat you, not, not what they said to you, but how they made you feel, you know, um, which I have a bunch. My, Maya Angelou is one of my personal heroes. Um, so for time's sake, I do want to just kind of do another quick uh, round. And Sandra, we'll go back to you. If you would just share with the audience, just based on our conversation here, and then I'll conclude it with a, a one of my, another quote from one of my personal heroes. Um, can you share any final thoughts or calls to action, given where we currently are as far as, and you all touched on it, the, the challenges we have with COVID-19, the challenges we have with what's going, what is school going to look like in the fall, um, the what I would say required, needed, and hopefully fully engaged conversations that our students are going to want to have around race, around culture and around our societal structures that, you know, I didn't bring it up earlier, uh, juxtaposing the difference between, you know, systems, systemic, systematic, and institutions. I'll, I'll save that for another time for time's sake, but just, you know, some final thoughts that you can share with the audience who's tuned in with us this evening. Sure. sure. Um, so what, what I would say is um, have the courage to speak your truth. Have the courage to speak your truth and to honor those who we serve. So in any organization, whatever capacity you lead, whether it's the classroom level, whether it's a parent academy, whether it's the um, district office or a school site, have the courage to speak your truth because engaging our families and engaging our students in those conversations are so critical to their trajectory. And so when we honor that and we speak our truth, we have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I will share this, it, it is something that, um, I watched a TED talk not long ago and I, I posted it on Twitter. Her name is uh, Lovey Aaliyah and she was so amazing about talking about the domino and I received that message. She said, be the domino, be the domino because when one domino trickles and has the courage to say something, to, to talk about your truth and to honor our black and brother, our black and brown brothers and sisters and when somebody falls, we all fall. And if we don't open the door, uh, it won't, it, it'll stay closed. And so when you speak your truth and she talks about the domino, she talks about be that first domino to have the courage to say something. Because when you say something and you speak your truth, others are thinking probably the same thing, but aren't sure if it's a safe context to share it. And we are culturally um, kind of uh, in this box based on our, our, our experiences to not challenge, to not say anything about the dominant culture. And so once you start getting comfortable with speaking your truth and comfortable with making sure that you do everything you can to serve your students and the actions that I take today will be leaps and bounds for them later, you'll get honest and you'll have the courage to share that truth and to be the domino that sparks that first drop that others will then follow because of you. And so I, I say that to everyone that's on this call. I say that to you know my colleagues and, and I say that to myself every day because 
sometimes we don't, we're not sure. We're not sure if we can say something in the context or, you know, what are people going to say if, if I, you know, put myself out there on the edge of, uh, of, the, of the cliff to say something. But once you do, it's completely liberating and you know that you're doing it for all the right reasons to open doors for the students and the families that we serve. And they will always, always embrace that thought. So thank you. Wow, thank you. <laughs> wow. Uh, let's go ahead and shift over to Anthony. Some final thoughts and call to action for our audience. All right, so I guess uh, I, I love that whole piece about being courageous and to go along with that. Um, I'd like to talk about that part about listening. Listen to our students. They've gone through a lot mm -hmm. in these last four or five months and um, the, they're, they're going to come back to our building. Like you said, they're going to want to have those conversations. And so we have to be very intentional about providing that forum, providing, providing that platform for them to express themselves. We have to be willing to listen to them and we have to be willing to deal with the trauma that they have experienced because a lot of these black and brown students are coming back and they're going to see police officers in our building and there's going to be this automatic distrust. Um, they're going to see and hear things that are, are not going to sit well with them or they're not going to know how to interpret them. And it's up to us as educators and it's up to us as leaders to guide them through that piece. Um, we, we have to you know, be aware that every demographic, every subgroup, every student is special and they have very specific needs. And so we have to be, again, that, that word intentional continues to come up. We have to be very intentional about providing and prescribing specifically what they need. And we have to be very willing to do that because it's going to be tough. We're not going to know how to have those conversations, um, but, but we have to be willing to, to do that because that trauma is real. And, uh, and, and that's gonna, it's gonna build into that culture in our buildings. And we just have to work to, to, to break that down um, from, from our seats. So I would say again, listen, be courageous, be intentional and be very, very specific um, as we continue to, uh, to provide for those social emotional needs of our students. Thank you very much. 100% on point. Thank you. Thank you. And so then, uh, Lynn, let's shift over to you. Final thoughts and ideally a call to action. Thank you. Sure. I love the word intentionality and I want to add the word preparation because without us being prepared to engage in those conversations, we can miss a lot of opportunities. Uh, to create spaces where we can be courageous. Uh, going back to what um, Anthony was saying, this whole experience, I often think about when people talk about access and there's beautiful school buildings where a lot of students walk in, but if you look at the school like Disney, right, and every classroom, every space is a ride, some of those rides are closed closed down and it can it can make kids feel as if hey you don't meet the height requirements just wait for the people to experience the roller coaster while you wait out here um, we can do better we can really do better and if we are prepared and and use opportunities to have real conversations honest conversations i think our kids can win as a result of our leadership so i would challenge those who are here participating to ask themselves um, is my school my district better the result of my leadership and how can i affect change am i using my voice in the right places am i being invited at a table and i'm being quiet and allowing uh, conversations to go on without raising my hand and speaking for kids because they are waiting for us to use our stories and our voices to really change the game in education uh, for them i know i feel responsible for that i am so honored to have been here today because uh, I, I think if we engage in this type of work and continue to use our voices in the right way, they stand a better future. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you all so much. I um, I do want to share share a quote um, and then kind of um, put the bow on our time together right now. And it, it's a quote from one of my personal heroes who, you know, to the point that was brought up earlier, um, I was not exposed to his writings when I was in high school. Uh, I actually wasn't even exposed to his writings when I was in college. It wasn't until later that it was of my own uh, my own volition that I did, and that's James Baldwin. And uh, the quote that I want to share with everyone here, which there's so many of his, is uh, the paradox of education is precisely this, that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which they are being educated. And so you want to keep in mind that our students are aware of the environments that they are in. They're aware of the messaging that they get, whether it's vocally or the messaging through the text or the messaging through the curriculum. And you all have heard really rich, beautiful stories from all three panelists that I, I, you can't see it because I'm wearing a shirt here, but I've gotten goosebumps the whole hour. And, and mm -hmm. I, I just want, I want all of us to take away from this conversation the importance of one, having the conversations, uh, and then two, ideally all of you will find some degree of inspiration or a whole lot like I did from all of these panelists so that as we shift into the summer and then we shift into the next school year and then we continue forth, that we're pushing the right things for the right reasons. We're pushing the conversations, we're pushing the thought, we're pushing each other. And, and when I say pushing each other, it's, it's you know, to borrow from Xander, we're, 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 we're making sure that one of us is the domino knowing that the rest of us are right there. And that's precisely why these conversations are around uplifting and building community. So um, in conclusion, I, I just, I, I, I wanna say, Nia Bonga to all three of you, which is thank you in Zulu. And and the, and again, even the translation of that is not just simply a thank you. It's it's an I see you, thank you, and it's a virtual hug. And I, I cannot thank you enough for your contributions to this conversation and the discourse that we had, and more importantly, your time. And here's the most important for what you all do for kids. So thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone who's tuned in. And uh, I really appreciate this so much. Thank you so much. I love that. <laughs> thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken. Ah, uh, thank you. That was magical. Mm. Oh, what an honor to be with all of you guys. Love everything.